Battle Cry. The name of the message today is Forbidden Fruit, Exploiting the Streisand Effect to Promote Controlled Opposition. And this message uh, is very important for the times we're living in uh, when it comes to people being deceived by politics, especially things that are going on in the world today. Uh, there's so many things manipulating people, you know, vying for their attention, pulling them in a million different directions. And uh, it's very easy for people to be led astray. And what I want to show today is that people don't realize how much they're actually being exploited with knowledge. There's actually knowledge out here that's been out there for, you know, decades, publicly documented that there are, you know, psychological techniques that can be used to exploit the masses of people in order to get them to do certain things. And there are many psychologists, social scientists, marketers who know these things. They understand these concepts. And they have been, here's the key point, they have been advisors to political campaigns. And that is very important to understand. Uh, a lot of people don't don't know this. A lot of people have never even heard about that, really. They just think that, you know, people run political campaigns and, and some persuade some people and some don't. They, you know, they kind of do this, you know, uh, try and see what works, see what's, you know, throw everything against the wall, see what sticks, trial and error, whatever. Things like that. It's not true at all, actually. These things have been... Uh, you know, perfected and honed over many decades. And I know a lot about this stuff because I used to study a lot about marketing myself. I used to, to be in the marketing world. And uh, what I noticed is it was filled with a lot of uh, awful people, scam artists, sociopaths. And so I didn't really like that. But I did do some studying up on what they do. Uh, you know, I read multiple books all about marketing and sales and these types of things. And what I found was that not only could these techniques be used to sell people things, to market products, businesses and brands and all these things, but it could also be used in the political world to manipulate people's opinions and uh, their support for uh, certain politicians or positions, you know, political positions that they want to promote and so that's what we're going to be talking about today. And this does all tie together with uh, spiritual things. I'm going to show you that at the end. So make sure you stick around for that as well. So having said all that, let's get into the first part, which we're talking about today, which is the Streisand effect. Now, you may, may have heard about this before, but I'm not only just going to talk to you about what the Streisand effect is. I'm going to go deeper than that. And you might not realize that this is actually Streisand effect is uh, it is a form of what is called psychological reactance. And we're going to study that a little bit more. So uh, you really need to watch the whole thing, listen to it, because I guarantee you there's going to be some things you haven't heard of before. But this is important to start with. The Streisand effect. Uh, actually, one last thing I wanted to uh, say is that I almost made the title of this message uh, Attacked and Banned or Part of the Plan because that is one of the biggest things that's manipulating people right now is that people think because someone is attacked or something or they're banned, they're censored, then that means they are good or they tell the truth and they should be trusted. That's the biggest thing we're going to be talking about today. And I'm not really going to focus on any particular person, whether it's someone in alternative media or some type of politician or someone else who you you know, who needs to be warned against. I want you to learn the principles so that you can apply it to anyone and anything. That's the point of this, okay? So, let's get into uh, looking at the Streisand effect. So here, very simply here, go to the art, the wiki article on Streisand effect. It'll just tell you, you know, the basics about this. But it's something that you should definitely understand. And I'm going to show you the depth behind it afterwards. The Streisand effect is an unintended consequence of attempts to hide, remove, or censor information where the effort instead backfires by increasing awareness of that information. 
It is named after American singer and actress Barbara Streisand, whose attempt to suppress Kenneth Edelman's website publication of his photograph of her clifftop residence in Malibu, California, taken to document California coastal erosion, inadvertently drew far greater attention to the previously obscure photograph in 2003. Okay, so Streisand effect, yes, is named after the entertainer, the singer and actress Barbara Streisand, because they were just documenting uh, coastal erosion, but her house appeared in a picture and, you know, she tried to get that taken down trying to, uh, you know, use, write letters to get the picture taken down. And then instead of having the effect of getting it taken down and suppressed so that no one looks at it, the opposite happened and many people became more interested in what happened. And then uh, I'm actually going to skip down to that real quick, that uh, history and etymology of it. Here's what it says. In 2003, American singer and actress Barbara Streisand sued photographer Kenneth Edelman and Pictopia.com for $50 million for violation of privacy. The lawsuit sought to remove Image 3850, an aerial photograph in which Streisand's mansion was visible from the publicly available California Coastal Records Project of 12,000 California coastline photographs documenting coastal erosion and intended to influence government policymakers, of which the photograph of her residence was an overlooked and inconsequential tidbit of information. The lawsuit dismissed, this lawsuit was dismissed, and Streisand was ordered to pay Edelman's $177,000 legal attorney fees. Image 3850, now watch this. Image 3850 had been downloaded only six times prior to Streisand's lawsuit, two of those being by Streisand's attorneys. Public awareness of the case led to more than 420,000 people visiting the site over the following month. In one month, 420,000 people wanted to come see this the picture of this house And why was that? Because it was uh, being suppressed. Someone was saying, hey, I don't want anyone to see this photograph. So then what happens? Everyone wants to see the photograph. Two years later, Mike Masnick of Tech Dirt named, named the effect after the Streisand incident when writing about Marco Beach Ocean Resort's takedown notice to urinal.net, a site which is dedicated... To, dedicated to photographs of urinals, that's great, over its use of the resort's name. So listen to the quote here from Mike Masnick. How long is it going to take before lawyers realize that the simple act of trying to repress something they don't like online is likely to make it so that something that most people would never ever see, like a photo of a urinal in some random beach resort, is now seen by many more people. Let's call it the stry sand effect. And that was from Mike Masnick. Since when is it illegal to just mention a trademark online? Tech Dirt, January uh, 5th, 2005. So that's really how the Streisand effect got its name. So as you can see, uh, this all started, th- you know, this this uh, idea of the Streisand effect because She tried to stop everyone from seeing the picture of her house and then everybody wanted to see it. And so this phenomenon began began to be applied to, you know, many other things. The Streisand effect was noticed in uh, many different areas of life. And so what you see is that when someone attempts to suppress something and then people get wind that it is being suppressed, they want to see that suppressed thing way more than they would if no one had talked about it. No one made a big deal about trying to hide it. And it says here, the Streisand effect is an example of psychological reactance, wherein once people are aware that some information is being kept from them, they are significantly more motivated to acquire and spread it. Exactly. That's what it is. Okay, so now you you have a basic understanding as to what it is. I'm going to give you a couple examples of uh, the Streisand effect 
There's actually a wiki page on list of Streisand effect examples. And uh, I'm just going to show you a few examples, and then we'll move on to the deeper stuff to see what's, uh, what's really going on behind this. So here's a few examples. The French intelligence agency, DCRI's attempt to delete the French Wikipedia article about the military radio station of Pierre Surhat resulted in the restored article temporarily becoming the most viewed page on the French Wikipedia. Okay? So they try to delete it, and then it becomes the most viewed page. Here's another one. A 2013 libel suit by Greek politician Theodore Katsanivas against a Greek Wikipedia editor resulted in members of the project bringing the story to the attention of journalists. And uh, here's one more. In 2017, the government of South Africa stated their intention to ban the book, The President's Keepers, detailing corruption within the government of then-President Jacob Zuma. This resulted in sales of the book skyrocketing dramatically, and it sold out within 24 hours before the ban was to be put into effect. This made the book a national bestseller and led to multiple reprints. Okay, Why? Because everyone heard the book was going to be banned. And so whenever some... You know, whenever people think something's going to be banned, it's going to be censored, then the demand skyrockets. It goes through the roof. Everyone wants to see it. They want to hear it. Whatever it is that is potentially going to be banned or is banned. And so you go through all these examples and it shows you all through history in politics and government, in businesses, them doing it, other organizations, by individuals, you know, Example after example. Now, one of the biggest points I want to make right here is this has been documented and known, again, for decades. It's well known. And so if people, there's leaders of governments around the world, other deep state actors that know about the Streisand effect. They know about it very well. Is it a possibility that they could exploit the Streisand effect in order to manipulate people. I submit to you that yes, they can and they do. And so let's move on to the next point. So the next thing we're going to look at, it was we're going to look at a small section. We're going to look at a section from uh, this book called Influence by an author named Robert Cialdini. Now, Robert Cialdini is very well known in the marketing world. He's an American psychologist and uh, not only is he a psychologist, but he wrote this book, Influence, and it talked about uh, different tactics that have been used by uh, different companies with in regards to sales and marketing. And he documented those tactics and he explained, you know, how they work through the lens of psychology, how they how they how they work to uh, manipulate human behavior and. This, by the way, is the book Influence originally came out in the 80s, 1984. And uh, the, here, there's more to it than that, though. Not only did he write that book and it explains these different tactics, uh, which the Streisand effect would fall under one of those tactics we'll be talking about. Not only that, but he also went on to advise political campaigns. Yes, Absolutely. And so I want you to show you that real quick before we go to his book. Shaldini wrote the 1984 book on persuasion and marketing, Influence the Psychology of Persuasion. It was based on three undercover years applying for and training at used car dealerships, fundraising organizations, and telemarketing firms to observe real-life situations of persuasion. He found that influence is based on six key principles, and he talks about these reciprocity, commitment, consistency, all these things. And scarcity is one of them. We're going to be talking about scarcity. That's what we're going to focus on, that category. And so it goes on, you know, it became a bestseller book and all these things, right? Well, here's one other fact. Shaldini was hired alongside many other behavioral scientists for the Barack Obama presidential campaign 2012. Now, I don't want you to get the, you know, make the mistake of thinking we're only talking about Democrats or we're only talking about Republicans. I am not at all. Okay. 
You should not trust any of them. And I want you to know that both sides use these tactics. But I'm just showing you right now for a fact, it is documented that this man, it says alongside many other behavioral scientists, advised the Obama campaign in 2012. Okay? And which was successful, by the way. And it says he advised the early stages of Hillary Clinton, but she, uh, they didn't listen to him and he got off the train before she lost and he actually made the point that it was bad for them to call all the Trump supporters dumb and deplorables and all these things. He said that wasn't going to work. And of course, it did not work. Okay, for Hillary. Now, uh, like, like I said, you don't want to get caught on all the individual names and the political parties and these types of things. Just focus on the tactics and especially focus on the fact that, hey, listen, these political campaigns are getting advice from psychologists, from behavioral scientists on how they can manipulate human behavior and political opinions of the masses. It's a fact. Okay, so this is not a conspiracy theory. This is documented out in the open and it cannot be denied. And now what I'm showing you today, so that's documented fact. Now, what we're going to look at today more is how does it work? What tactics are they using? Now, it's many different tactics, but we're, today we're talking about the one tactic of the Streisand effect. Okay, so now let's look at what category that falls under in Shaldini's book, Influence. Okay, so now we're going to look at Robert Cialdini's book, uh, Influence, and Chapter Seven, which is called which is called Scarcity. Okay, this is the principle of scarcity. So, and the Streisand effect does fall under that. Scarcity, the rule of the few, is a quote here. The way to love anything is to realize that it might be lost. G.K. Chesterton. Well, that's a quote to go along with this theme here. Okay, so we're going to read some of this. And, and the introduction is good to understand the basics of the scarcity principle. Then we're going to jump to psychological reactants. We're going to really going to focus on that. So he says this, The city of Mesa, Arizona is a suburb in the Phoenix area where I live. Perhaps the most notable features of Mesa are its sizable Mormon population, next to that of Salt Lake City, the largest in the world, and a huge Mormon temple located on an exquisitely kept grounds in the center of the city. Although I had appreciated the landscaping and architecture from a distance, I had never been interested enough in the temple to go inside until the day I read a newspaper article that told of a special inner sector of Mormon temples to which no one has access but faithful members of the church. Even potential converts must not see it. There is one exception to the rule, however. For a few days immediately after a temple is newly constructed, non-members are allowed to tour the entire structure, including the otherwise restricted section. The newspaper story reported that the Mesa Temple had recently been refurbished and that the renovations had been extensive enough to classify it as new by church standards. Thus, for the next several days only, non-Mormon visitors could see the temple area traditionally banned to them. I remember quite well the effect of the article on me. I immediately resolved to take a tour. But when I phoned a friend to ask if he wanted to come along, I came to understand something that changed my decision just as quickly. After declining the invitation, my friend wondered why I seemed so intent on a visit. I was forced to admit that no, I had never been inclined toward the idea of a temple tour before, that I had no questions about the Mormon religion I wanted answered, that I had no general interest in the architecture of houses of worship, and that I expected to find nothing more spectacular or stirring than I might see at a number of other temples, churches, or cathedrals in the area. It became clear as I spoke that the special lure of the temple had a sole cause. If I did not experience the restricted sector shortly, I would never have had the chance. I would never again have the chance. 
Something that, on its own merits, held little appeal for me had become decidedly more attractive merely because it would soon become unavailable. Okay? So, you know, Shaldini here, he admits that he experienced the effect of this scarcity principle himself. That he had no interest in seeing touring a Mormon temple, didn't care at all. But when it's when he heard that, oh, you know, you'll get this small window to be able to go see it and then you can't ever see it again, all of a sudden, oh, I want to see it now. Since that encounter with the scarcity principle, that opportunities seem more valuable to us when their availability is limited, I have begun to notice its influence over a whole range of my actions. For instance, I routinely will interrupt an interesting face-to-face -face conversation to answer the ring of an unknown caller. In such a situation, the caller has a compelling feature that my face-to-face -face partner does not, potential unavailability. If I don't take the call, I might miss it, and the information it carries for good. Never mind that the ongoing conversation may be highly engaging or important, much more than I could reasonably expect an average phone call to be. With each unanswered ring, the phone interaction becomes less retrievable. For that reason and for that moment, I want it more than the other. The idea of potential loss plays a, role, uh, a large role in human decision making. In fact, people seem to be more motivated by the thought of losing something than by the thought of gaining something of equal value. For instance, homeowners told how much money they could lose from inadequate insulation are more likely to insulate their homes than those told how much money they could save. Similar results have been obtained by health researchers. Pamphlets urging young women to check for breast cancer through self-examinations are significantly more successful if they state their case in terms of what stands to be lost. For instance, you can lose several potential health benefits by failing to spend only five minutes each month doing a breast self-examination rather than gained. For instance, saying you can gain several potential health benefits by spending only five minutes each month doing a self-examination. Okay, so... People are more motivated by when you tell them, hey, you could lose something if you don't do this. Okay? And again, it's important to understand that a lot of this has been studied and known, understood by advertisers, by marketers, by, you know, salesmen. And they consciously study these things and apply them to, to their, uh, you know, their businesses to manipulate people to get the sales. And they've been doing it for a long time. Okay? Now, let's go down to psychological reactants to, to get a little bit more information here. Okay, so let's look at psychological reactants, which is under the category of scarcity. And this is really where we get to understand the Streisand effect even more. The evidence, is, the evidence then is clear. Compliance practitioners' reliance on scarcity as a weapon of influence is frequent, Wide-ranging, systematic, and diverse. Now, I want to stop there real quick, and I want you to listen to the wording here. First of all, compliance practitioners. Think about that word, that phrase for a second. Compliance practitioner. And then the other phrase, weapon of influence. There are compliance practitioners out there using weapons of influence on you. Make sure you remember that. Whenever such is the case with the weapon of influence, we can feel assured that the principle involved has notable power in directing human action. In the instance of the scarcity principle, that power comes from two major sources. The first is familiar. Like the other weapons of influence, the scarcity principle trades on our weakness for shortcuts. The weakness is, as before, an enlightened one. In this case, because we know that the things that are difficult to possess are typically better than those things that are easy to possess, we can often use an item's availability to help us quickly and correctly decide on its quality. Thus, one reason for the potency of the scarcity principle is that by following it, we are usually inefficiently right. Okay, so sometimes it is true, right? Something's not as available. It's because it's in high demand because it's a good product. That very well may be true. But some people can manipulate that principle to deceive people. That's, that's the real point here. In addition, there is a unique 
secondary source of power within the scarcity principle. As opportunities become less available, we lose freedoms, and we hate to lose the freedoms we already have. This desire to preserve our established prerogatives is the centerpiece of psych psychological reactance theory, developed by psychologist Jack Brem to explain the human response to diminishing personal control. According to the theory, whenever free choice is limited or threatened, the need to retain our freedoms makes us desire them, as well as the goods and services associated with them, significantly more than previously. So when increasing scarcity or anything else interferes with our prior access to some item, we will react against the interference by wanting and trying to possess the item more than before. Okay, and you're going to see this later on. It talks about how it's not as powerful when, you know, you just never, there's always scarcity. It's more powerful when someone has something and then it's threatened to be taken away and to be made scarce or, you know, it was, uh, you know, there was abundance of it and then it becomes scarce after, then the demand shoots way up, okay? So it, people have to have a taste of, of it before it gets taken away or threatened. As simple as the kernel of the theory seems, it shoots and root, its shoots and roots curl extensively through much of the social environment. From the garden of young love to jungle of armed revolution to the fruits of the marketplace, impressive amounts of our behavior can be explained by examining for the tendrils of psychological reactants. Before beginning such an examination, though, it would be helpful to know when people first show the desire to fight against restrictions of their freedoms. And that would be from the very beginning. Child psychologists have traced the tendency back to the start of the third year of life a year independently identified as a problem by parents and widely known to them as the terrible twos. Uh, and so I, I don't think that's a good, you know, term, the terrible twos or whatever. It's, it's really, it's not so much about the specifically the number two, but it is that early age that, you know, when children start to, you know, uh, test the, the limits and the bounds of their independence and their free will and all these things, and they're told no about certain things, then they you can see they rebel against it. Of course, that proves the sinful nature of human beings, which is 100% the case, that you don't have to teach rebellion to children. They automatically have it from birth. The Bible says foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. That's how they come out. Now... Uh, again, when they're, you know, the brand new newborns, little infants, you don't really notice it that much. But once they can walk and and start to do, uh, you know, things here and there, then it starts to manifest. But it was always there. You just couldn't see it as much. So that's really what's going on there. And uh, I'll talk more about that later. Most parents can attest the development of a decided, more contrary style in the children around this period. Two-year-olds seem to master Masters of the art of resistance to outside, especially parental pressure. Tell them one thing, they do the opposite. Give them one toy, they want another. Pick them up against their will, they wriggle and squirm to be put down. Put them down against their will, they claw and struggle to be carried. Okay, that's a fact. That's what happens. Now, I want you to see this study, though, because this was pretty interesting uh, what happened. One Virginia-based study nicely captured the Terrible Two style among boys who averaged 24 months in age. The boys accompanied their mothers into a room containing two equally attractive toys. The toys were always arranged so that one stood next to a transparent plexiglass barrier and the other stood behind the barrier. For some of the boys, the plexiglass sheet was only a foot tall forming no real barrier to the toy behind. Since the boys could easily reach over the top, uh, since the boys could reach easily over the top. For the other boys, however, the plexiglass was two feet tall, effectively blocking the boys' access to one toy unless they went around the barrier. The researchers wanted to see how quickly the toddlers would make contact with the toys under these conditions. Their findings were clear. When the barrier was too small to restrict access to the toy behind it, the boys showed no special preference for either of the toys. On the average, the toy next to the barrier was touched as quickly, just as quickly as the one behind. 
But when the barrier was big enough to be a true obstacle, the boys went directly to the obstructed toy, making contact with it three times faster than with the unobstructed toy. In all, the boys in this study demonstrated the classic Terrible Two's response to a limitation of their freedom, outright defiance. Okay, so that is very important to see here that this has been demonstrated with this this simple study. One toy, you know, you think about this. How many times have you seen with children that they have a ton of toys and they have free access to any toy they want to play with, but they don't want it. They're not interested. They're bored. They don't want to play anything. I'm bored. And they have all kinds of toys around them. Right? That happens all the time. And yet, it shows here, and I've seen many examples of this, that when it comes to a toy that is, they don't have even just wanting to buy a toy, right? How often do commercials target children? They have been for a long time. They target children directly and like, oh, I want that toy, I want that toy. And why do they want it so bad when they see the commercial? It's something that they don't have. But when they get the toy, like the action figure, whatever it is, they play, they're excited, they play with it for a little bit, and then a couple weeks later, they don't care anymore. Why don't they care anymore? Because they already have access to it. The appeal is gone. It's no longer something that is, you know, they couldn't have. And now that they have it, they, they don't have the same uh, reaction. And it showed that in this study. And so this is important to show that this starts from the very beginning. And it's important to note that psychologists understand that this is how human beings work from the very beginning. And so it's easier, easier to exploit them as adults. They, they don't really change up the principle too much. The same thing that worked, uh, you know, this thing that worked with the with the children, the toddlers, is the same thing that works with adults. It really does. Okay. All right. Now I'm going to show you another example of the psychological reactants, but this can be uh, something that applies to lawmakers. For twos and teens, then psychological reactants flows across the broad surface of experience, always turbulent and forceful. For most of the rest of us, the pool of reactant energy lies quiet and covered, erupting geyser-like only on occasion. Still, these eruptions manifest themselves in a variety of fascinating ways that are of interest not only to the student of human behavior, but to lawmakers and policymakers. And we're going to look at an example right now. For instance, there's an odd case of Kennesaw, Georgia, the town that enacted a law requiring every... Requiring... Listen to this. Require they were <laughs> they enacted a law requiring every adult resident to own a gun and ammunition under penalty of six months in jail and two hundred dollar fine. Imagine that a law saying you have to own a gun, but that's what happened. Under the all the features of the Kennesaw gun law make it a prime target for psychological reactants. The freedom that the law restricts is an important, long-standing one to which most American citizens feel entitled. For, furthermore, the law was passed by the Kennesaw City Council with a minimum of public input. Reactance theory would predict that under these circumstances, few of the adults in the town of 5,400 would obey. Yet newspaper reports testified that three to four weeks after the passage of the law, firearm sales in Kennesaw were, no pun intended, booming. Now, hold on right there because you're going to see why. It's not what you think. How are we to make sense of this apparent contradiction of the reactants principle? By looking a bit more closely at those who were buying Kennesaw's guns. Interviews with Kennesaw store owner owners revealed that the gun buyers were not town residents at all, but visitors, many of them lured by publicity to purchase their initial gun in Kennesaw. Donna Green, proprietor of a shop described in one newspaper article as a virtual grocery store of firearms, summed it up. They said, business is great, but they're almost all being bought by people from out of town. We've only had two or three local people buy a gun to comply with the law. 
After passage of the law, then, gun buying had become a frequent activity in Kennesaw, but not among those it was intended to cover. They were massively non-compliant. Only those individuals whose freedom in the matter had not been restricted by the law had the inclination to live by it. See that? So it, it proved it again. They passed the law. Oh, you got to own a gun. Nobody cares in the town. But people out of town, oh man, we got to go get guns. And this has happened multiple times in history. Whenever the, 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 uh, the administration is threatening to, to restrict firearm rights, the gun sales are booming. They sell more than ever. You think they don't know that? Of course they do. Of course they do. They do that over and over again. You think they would never learn? That's so ridiculous. I can't believe people think that they don't know what they're doing. Very, very foolish, naive mentality to have. Of course they know what they're doing. Okay? Now, we go on to the next point here. All right, so we're going to read a couple more paragraphs from, from this uh, book, and then we're going to move on to the next uh, source. The tendency to want what has been banned and therefore to presume that it is more worthwhile is not limited to such commodities as laundry, soap. In, fa in fact, the tendency is not limited to commodities at all, but extends to restrictions on information. In an age when the ability to acquire, store, and manage information is becoming increasingly the determinant of wealth and power, it is important to understand how we typically react to attempts to censor or otherwise constrain our access to information. Although much data exists on our reactions to various kinds of potential, potentially censorable material, media violence, pornography, radical political rhetoric, there is surprisingly little evidence as to our reactions to the act of censoring them. Fortunately, the results of the few studies that have been done on the topic are highly consistent. Almost invariably, our response to the banning of information is a greater desire to receive that information and a more favorable attitude toward it than before the ban. Okay, this is very important to understand what I am talking about today. Okay, because this is the deception that people are under. Okay, people think, so many people think, because something is banned, therefore it must be true, it must be good. Oh, the deep state hates that information, they hate that person, they're trying to suppress it so that we can't have access to that, and so it must be good and it must be true. That's the deception that you're under. And it's wrong. It's it's dead wrong. Okay? So, you know, this applies to information. Very important to understand that. All right, so the last we're going to read about is optimal conditions for the, the scarcity principle. And again, just to remind you, this is this is explaining, you know, the big picture about the Streisand effect that people uh, want, they desire more strongly what has been banned and censored and things that are attacked, these types of things. But this is the last point. It's important to make about this is the optimal conditions, okay? Because it doesn't work if, let's say someone, you know, had some information, they put out a video, it only got a few hundred views and then it was banned. Well, not that many people know about it, you know, so it's not gonna really have that big of an effect. Now, if it, all of a sudden, you know, everybody knew, hey, wait a second, this video is so important and everybody needs to watch this and it's been banned, then it could have the same effect. Or let's say something, uh, a lot of times what happens is, you know, something is allowed to get a ton of views or everybody sees it and then it gets banned. Well, now people want to see it way more than they did before because a lot of people already knew about it. It's already out in the open, but now that it's banned, they have the, the reaction to it. The Streisand effect happens. So, uh, you know, either has to be there in the first place or, you know, has to be promoted some other way. But now take a look at this. Much like the other effective weapons of influence, the scarcity principle is more effective at some times than at other times. An important practical problem then is to find out when scarcity works best on us. 
A great deal can be learned in this regard from an experiment devised by social psychologist Stephen Warchel. The basic procedure used by Warchel and his, and his research team was simple. Participants in a consumer preference study were given a chocolate chip cookie from a jar and asked to taste and rate its quality. For half of the raters, the jar contained, uh, contained 10 cookies. For the other half, it contained just two. As you might expect from the scarcity principle, when the cookie was one of the only two available, it was rated more favorably than when it was one of 10. The cookie in short supply was rated as more desirable to eat in the future, more attractive as a consumer item, and more costly than the identical cookie in abundant supply. So think about that. There's no difference between these cookies. There's no difference between the cookies in the jar that when they had uh, 10 cookies or the jar that has two cookies. Same exact cookies. There isn't some drastic difference in quality and the taste, but people acted like the one with two cookies was better. That's how powerful this is because of the scarcity principle. The first of these noteworthy results involved a small variation in the experiment's basic procedure. Rather than rating the cookies under conditions of constant scarcity, some participants were first given a jar of 10 cookies that was then replaced by a jar of two cookies. Thus, I'm going to apply this to politics in a second, by the way. Thus, before taking a bite, certain of the participants saw their abundant supply of cookies reduced to a scarce supply. Other participants, however, knew only scarcity of supply from the outset, since the number of cookies in their jars were left at two. With this procedure, the researchers were seeking to answer a question about types of scarcity. Do we value more those things that have recently become less available to us or those things that have always been scarce? In the cookie experiment, the answer was plain. The drop from abundance to scarcity produced a decidedly more positive reaction from to the cookies than did constant scarcity, okay? So way bigger of a reaction when people have something and then it's restricted or it's taken away. Then they want it even more. If it's always restricted and always scarce, not as much of a demand. The idea that newly experienced scarcity is the more powerful kind of uh, kind applies to situations well beyond the bounds of the cookie study. For example, social scientists have determined that such scarcity is a primary cause of political turmoil and violence. Perhaps the most prominent proponent of this argument is James Davies, who states that we are most likely to find revolutions where a period of improving economic and social conditions is followed by a short, sharp reversal in those conditions. Thus, it is not the traditionally most downtrodden people who have come to see their deprivation as part of the natural order of things who are especially liable to revolt. Instead, revolutionaries are more likely to be those who have been given at least some taste of a better life. When the economic and social improvements they have experienced and come to expect suddenly become less available, they desire them more than ever and often rise up violently to secure them. Davies has gathered persuasive evidence for his novel thesis from a range of revolutions, revolts, internal wars, including the French, Russian, Egyptian revolutions, as well as domestic uprisings and as Doors Rebellion in the 19th century, Rhode Island, uh, the American Civil War, and the urban black riots in the 1960s. In each case, a time of increasing well-being preceded a tight cluster of reversals that burst into violence. And I submit to you again that this can be manipulated to do that on purpose. Yes, of course. If they have these people, they have all these people that have this knowledge, they've done all these studies. Do are you so foolish and naive to think? That intelligence agencies don't want to study those same things and to use that knowledge and that they it would be beyond the pale to, to think that they would use that knowledge against the population of a country? Come on. Grow up. Stop being naive. It's ridiculous. Of course they would use that information. And they do. They know. 
about the scarcity principle, psychological reactants, the Streisand effect. And we can see under the optimal conditions, it, e it works even more when you give people a little prosperity, then pull it away. Or they have some freedom, then you threaten to take it away. They know how you're going to react every time, and they play you like a fiddle. Now we're going to move on to the next source. Okay, so the next thing we're going to look at is a book called 8020 Sales and Marketing. And it's by a man named Perry Marshall. Now, Perry Marshall has been very um, influential in the world of marketing. And uh, in this book, he talks about a number of different principles. The main thing he focuses on is this 80-20 rule, the Pareto curve, all these things. But in chapter 20, he talks about controversy. Get famous by polarizing your market. Now, this um, this definitely plays into the subject today. Uh, and, and so I'm going to go go through this chapter a little bit and, and show you some of it so that you can see, again, how these marketing principles also applies to politics. And he himself applies it to politics. OK, but this is a marketer, right? 8020 Sales and Marketing. It's a book about sales and marketing. Why is he talking about politics again? Because that's what they use in politics. Okay? So, let's get into it. Uh, chapter 20, Get Famous by Polarizing Your Market. 8020 says that you and I must always design mechanisms into our advertising that segments our prospects into categories. One, not interested. Two, mildly interested. Three, interested, hopefully soon. Then interested right now, extremely interested, fascinated, and transfixed, insanely obsessed and addicted. Of course, lead generation eliminates the people at stage one or two and leaves you with the rest, making your job as a salesperson much easier. But the real profits come as you cultivate people at levels of five, six, and seven. They're much easier and less expensive to sell to. But there's a whole another dimension to this, which is when you... When those seven categories describe not only how much people love you, but how much they hate you, okay? Pay attention. The Amazon.com three-star rating phenomenon of hyper-responsive, rabid markets. There's a very interesting, very instructive phenomenon that occurs in many markets and walks of life. If it exists in your market, you're a fool not to harness it. The easiest place to observe it is in the book reviews on Amazon. Let's pick a controversial book. Hillary Clinton's It Takes a Village is a great example. People either love her or hate her. Rarely is anyone neutral about Hillary Clinton. Again, please don't focus on the person, okay? This isn't about Hillary Clinton. It's not about Trump or Clinton or Obama or any Republican or Democrat. Just focus on the principles that can be used with anyone. And I mean anyone. Uh, almost all books on highly controversial topics or books written by or about controversial people have average ratings of three stars, but hardly any actual three star ratings. All of the reviews are either one star or five stars. Hillary's book, It Takes a Village, is in fact a perfect case study. Highly polarizing books have lots of five star ratings and lots of one star ratings and hardly any three stars. See the lots of five-star, one-star profile on the number of reviews? That is two 80-20 curves back-to-back. -back. One is forward, the other is backward. So your market actually looks like it shows a figure. The 80-20 saddle curve is when your market is driven by two groups, those for and those against. You get two 80-20 curves back-to-back -back representing two levers. Almost all the controversy is fueled by a small minority of hyper-extremes. I call this the 80-20 saddle curve. You are really dealing with two 20%. Two groups of hyper-responsive buyers. People who love you. People who hate you. Top two 5%. Top two 1%. It shows the, uh, the diagram there. Okay. You clearly see this in any controversial topic. Liberals versus conservatives. Democrats versus Republicans. Pro-life versus pro-choice. Creation versus evolution. Union versus anti-union. All these things. In all these scenarios, two small, highly polarized groups of people control the majority of a conversation. The entire landscape is dominated by those two sides. 
Eric Hoffer, in his incredibly insightful book, The True Believer, said, The game of history is usually played by the best and the worst over the heads of the majority in the middle. This is hugely important in politics, shaping public policies and elections, because the apathetic middle doesn't matter. They don't care enough to make their voice heard. In election, they don't vote. They don't care. In an election, the extreme 5% on each side is not going to change. Hardcore conservatives are going to vote conservative. Hardcore liberals are going to vote liberal. Very little will change that. The middle is not going to show up at the polls and cast a vote either. So the election is really swung one way or the other by the moderately interested left, moderately interest right. This is a major component of any campaign strategy. In fact, I did an entire interview about this regarding the U.S. 2012 election and the battle between Obama and Romney. It vividly shows what Obama did differently than Romney and why Obama won. In an economic climate that was favorable in many ways to Romney, you can access that and he shows where you can get it. The 80-20 saddle curve makes it simple and easy to see what's really going on in a power struggle between opposing sides. This applies in any market that's prone to controversy. And what market is there with no controversy? And I want you to think about this. It could be arguments about children's immunization, participation in the European Union, PC versus Mac, cotton versus polyester. It doesn't matter what it is. Anything. No matter what market you're in, there's a controversy about something. The fastest, easiest way to become famous is to pick a side that you're passionate about and start advocating. This is the straightest path to selling books. But if you sell, say, equipment, there are always controversies in an industry about how it should be used. If you take a definite position, you're, you're quotable. If you're quotable, magazine editors quote you. Then you get invited to be on panels at conferences. People see you in public, and it's always easier to close a sale when you're a mini-celebrity. So, for example, I hope you guys are thinking about this, about how this applies to so many different things today and people. I really should get the gears turning. So, for example, this means that there's two kinds of blog posts. One, everybody's on the same side blog post with 500 comments from 498 people. Two, two of them commented twice. And number two, the four against blog post, it's got 500 comments from 50 people, 400 of the comments are from five people, two, four, three against. And they've been arguing back and forth with each other in your comment section for two weeks. <laughs> happens all the time. These two examples pretty much sum up people's opinions about this book. Sometimes the reviews are rebuttals to other reviews. So Amazon's review sections become a place of ferocious debate between people on two sides of a particular spectrum. The 80-20 saddle curve is right there in the review summary. All we have to do is turn it on its side. The Amazon reviews of Hillary Clinton's book are quintessential examples, examples of for against. There's a potent marketing lesson here. Who buys a book like It Takes a Village? Who reads it? Two kinds of people. People who love Hillary, people who hate her guts. Those are the only two kinds of people who matter. Most political and social battles are fought by the people on the extremes. They are the only ones who speak out and the only ones who really even pay attention to Hillary at all. The beauty of this is you get to collect dinero from both folks on both sides of the aisle. Now, I'm not saying this. Perry Marshall saying this, okay? He is viewing this through the lens of a marketer. He said, hey, the beauty of this is we get to get money from people on both sides of the aisle. Which, if you think about it, means they don't care what someone's opinion is. Whether it's for or against, who cares? They don't care about that. They, they, they care about manipulating discourse as long as they're making money. And then, of course, when it comes to actually how politicians and, and other agencies manipulate the political discourse, they're in it for more than just money, but manipulating uh, the opinions of the mass. And they don't just do it to one group. They do it to multiple groups. And, and I'm going to show you something very important here. We just need to read on a little bit. And I'm gonna, there's something I'm going to laser in on here, okay, that you really need to hear. The beauty of this is, okay, now, of course, the ones who hate Hillary are only going to give 
money for the book, they're not going to support her election. So she has to pander to the crowd that loves her dearly. But do not miss the fact that a significant portion of Hillary's book buyers were people who can't stand her. If you want to get love and adoration from raving fans, you almost certainly need to be willing to be reviled by others. If you are not willing to take a stand, you are boring. You are milk toast. You have nothing interesting to say. A lot, yes, a lot of times in the marketing world, they say, there's a saying that a message that appeals to everyone appeals to no one. Okay, no one's interested in a message that a try that tries to appeal to everyone. You know, uh, checks every box, appeals to all different groups. That's not effective. That's not powerful. It's when people take a strong position on anything and they defend it, and then some people will hate it, some will love it, but the people who love it will support it more than anyone who would uh, uh, would mildly support over a much wider audience. Uh, you learn to recognize those hyper-responsive people when you see them. You want to know how they walk and how they talk because when you're successful, you'll probably be appealing to one end of the sum spectrum and profiting from the rabid 5%. Okay, so let's look at this. They're extremely emotional to the point of being irrational. Sound familiar? Okay. I want you to think about the political landscape today as I go through these points. Okay. They're extremely emotional to the point of being irrational. Regardless of how wrong or right they may be, they won't entertain any possible merits of the other side. The most fanatical people on each extreme enjoy insulting their opponents and calling people ugly names. They love dogma and slogans. And that applies to more than one group, okay? Absolutely does. It does not just apply to Democrats, regardless of what you may think. And if you don't think that, it's because you're one of the people that's extremely emotional and irrational. That's a fact. The fastest way to permanently bond with a Hillary hater is to say something deliciously insulting about Hillary. Tell an excruciating Hillary joke. As soon as the words escape your lips, this person will feel an intense attraction toward you. They will suddenly want to buy something from you. They may invite you over to the house for dinner. They may ask you on a date. But it's true. I've seen that many times. People just start talking, you know, if someone hates a politician like that and they make a joke about them. Uh, instantly people bond over that stuff. There's nothing more powerful than selling against an enemy. Okay, now you need to really pay attention. There's nothing more powerful than selling against an enemy. Wow. The existence of a common enemy creates a market. If this sounds strange to you, remember how much Osama bin Laden toilet paper got sold after September 11th. And that did happen. I remember that happening, actually. But um, think about that, though. The existence of a common enemy, nothing more powerful than selling against an enemy. Okay? When you think about someone who's being attacked and banned and censored and like, oh, this guy is, you know, this person and that person, they're an enemy of the deep state and all these things, then people rally against that person. Because they say, hey, I'm being attacked by this enemy and people rally around the banned and attack person against the common enemy. It's very, very powerful. And what I'm telling you today is that can be done on purpose to get you to rally around someone to get you to support them. Be, you, you, what I'm saying is you're being manipulated. There are two sides to every argument. My friend Howie Jacobson grew up in the home of a labor leader and the slogan he heard growing up was up at the wages, down with the bosses. He can still sing three verses of Solidary Forever and the entire song Union Made by Woody Guthrie. It was only much later that he saw that there might be such a thing as bad employees. I, the, I had the opposite experience. I used to think labor unions were evil. It was only after I had three other salespeople had... Uh, I and three other salespeople had unanimously threatened to quit to get a vile, wicked human being out of our sales department that I realized that upper management can be quite clueless at times and, yes, abusive too. Next point. The dark side of all this is that it's hard to sell sanity and reason. Absolutely. It's much easier to sell fanaticism and reactionary behavior. Pay attention. 
Watch for the reaction, that provoking people to a reaction. However, if you do sell slogans and if you bond with your audience via a mutual enemy, do us all a favor and package some sanity and clear thinking with it somewhere. Please, I think it's your moral and social obligation to do so. And the last point here, the best rallying point for your own cause or position in the marketplace is strong opposition. Okay, so that's the last point I'm going to read from this book, but let's talk about it. He said the best rallying point for your own cause or position in the marketplace is strong opposition. So this is a known principle of marketing that a strong the best rallying point for your cause is strong opposition so if you could get someone out there that is a politician or holds a certain position in media whatever it is and they have strong opposition they are strongly opposed and attacked and banned and censored then people will rally around that person. They will support them. They will give them their money, their time, and they will be bonded to that person. They will look at them as a champion and they will give them undying support. Yes, that can be manipulated. You can be given artificial heroes. It's called controlled opposition. Someone who is Pretending to be opposition to evil, opposition to the deep state, opposition to all these bad things, but they're in fact, in reality, controlled. And they're using all these tactics to manipulate you in order to support that that person. And then that person takes you in a direction that you should not be going which is not threatening to the powers that be. It's not actually threatening, but they have to make it appear as if it is threatening to them when it is not. And you are not a threat whatsoever. That is the greatest way to destroy any real opposition is to control the opposition. That's how you do it. And this is the strategy as to how they do it. Okay, and now to wrap up this message, I am now going to bring it to spiritual things to show you that actually the Streisand effect and the scarcity principle and psychological reactants and uh, these things that Perry Marshall talked about, they're all rooted actually in uh, some spiritual principles and concepts that are taught in the Word of God. And I will show you plain as day. Okay, so here we go. Forbidden fruit. The origin of the Streisand effect actually goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Let's read about it. Genesis chapter 2 verse 16. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Okay, so what did God say to Adam? He said, you cannot eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You are forbidden from eating that fruit. And what happened? Well, this is what happened. The serpent came to the garden. Genesis chapter uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? He questioned God's word. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of, every, of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Okay, so not only did Adam know, but Eve knew that she was forbidden from eating the fruit of the tree of knowledge. And she told the serpent that. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So what is the serpent doing here? The serpent is saying, actually, 
you will not die when you eat that forbidden fruit. You, there's no danger. And be, not only is there no danger, there's actually benefit. There is a benefit to eating it. You shall be as gods. And so what the serpent is saying to Eve is, hey, there is a secret benefit that God is keeping from you. He is hiding the true benefit of this fruit from you. And if you eat of this forbidden fruit, it will be good for you. And he's provoking Eve to eat of the forbidden fruit. Verse 6, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And then what happened? They did spiritually die, and they were kicked out of the Garden of Eden, never to be able to return, and that was the fall of man. And what happened after that is that a sinful nature, the flesh, was passed on to every human being since then, which reacts, has this, the reaction, the same reaction as they did to the forbidden fruit in the garden, which is that this is forbidden from me, but... I see it as desirable. It doesn't matter that God is forbidden. I see it as desirable. And the serpent, the, the devil, promotes that and tempts man to encourage that behavior. But it is rooted in, in, the, in the sinful nature of the wicked heart of man. The Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. And so when they see that forbidden fruit... They want to eat of it. And it's been the case ever since. Ever since the beginning, man always wants to have that which he's not supposed to have. He wants the forbidden fruit. That is his sinful nature. And guess what? The Streisand effect is a targeting of that sinful nature to get to to get people to want things that they're not supposed to have. That's what it's appealing to. I'm going to show you some more about that. The strange woman uses the forbidden fruit tactic on men. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 13. A foolish woman is clamorous. She is simple. She knoweth nothing. For she sitteth on the, at the door of her house on a seat in the high places of the city to call passengers who go right in their ways. Whoso is simple, let him turn in hither and ask for him that wanteth understanding. And as for him that wanteth understanding, she saith to him, "What does she say? Stolen waters are sweet, and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. But he knoweth not that the dead are there, and that her guests are in the depths of hell." Okay. So what did this? A uh, strange woman, the foolish woman says she's trying to get, you know, she's trying to seduce men to come to her house to commit adultery with her. Right. And but what does she say? Stolen waters are sweet. Now, what does that mean? It means forbidden fruit tastes better than fruit that you're allowed to have. That's what she means by that. Forbidden fruit is better than anything that is lawful. It tastes better. It is sweet. Bread eaten in secret is pleasant. That which you're not supposed to have. It's more exciting. It's more pleasurable. And that is the Streisand effect in action right here with the strange woman. And so let's look at this a little bit more. The effect of the law of God on sinful man shows the root of of the Streisand effect. Okay? You have to understand this. Romans chapter 7, verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once. 
But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be death, unto death. Okay? So some people get confused by this, but let me explain it to you. Okay? Let's back up here and look at it. So first he starts talking about the law, right? And he says, uh, is the law sin? No, the law of God is not sinful. Okay, so you got that down. That is plainly stated. So don't think that the law of God is sinful or it makes man sinful. It doesn't. He says, no, but I had not known sin, but by the law. Because the law says, do not covet. Oh, okay, so that means lusting is a sin. It's showing what sin is. Okay, we got that. All right, now verse 8. This is where you need to pay attention. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. So what this is saying is, but sin, it's like personifying sin. But you think of it as the sinful nature of man, the flesh, right? It says the flesh, the sinful nature, taking occasion by the commandment. Meaning when it hears the commandment, when some a sinful lost person hears the commandment, it says, Rod in me all manner of concupiscence, and without the law, sin was dead. It was as if it was dormant in him, right? So it's there's a sinful nature there, obviously, but it was dormant. It's like it was sin was dead, it wasn't alive. Then he says in verse 9, But for I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. When he heard the commandment, sin revived. And what that means is the sinful nature flared up against the commandment to rebel against it. As, And, and that's exactly what we're talking about here. When, it, when they heard, do not steal, the flesh wants to steal. When it says, do not lust, the flesh wants to lust, wants to commit adultery, wants to do the, these things because sinful man, it says, the Bible says, the carnal mind is enmity against God. They that are in the flesh cannot please God. They cannot. And so when they're, you know, the sinful man, the flesh does not want to do good. So when he hears the commandment, he has the opposite reaction to it and wants to rebel against it. That's what happens when sinful man, he lost man, hears the law. He says the commandment which was ordained to life, I found it to be death. That's how he viewed it. It didn't, it didn't benefit him hearing the law. And that's true. I'm going to explain that, okay? So the Bible says, is the law sin? No, the law is not sin. The Bible says very clearly the law is holy. The commandment is holy. There is nothing wrong with the law of God. It's perfect. God made it. Okay, it's good. But the issue is here, the law of God with its forbidding of sin cannot restrain sinful man from evil or save sinful man. It cannot. It cannot restrain a sinful man from evil and it cannot save him. The law cannot save him. And so he hears the law and he knows, you know, here's what sin is, but the flesh reacts with, I want to do that which is forbidden. The law, this is what the law really does. The law exposes the exceeding sinfulness of man, his guilt before God, and his desperate need for the Savior. Let's look at where the Bible says that exactly. Romans chapter 3, verse 19. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So it shows all right here, summarizes the purpose of the law. It says that the law, by the law, is the knowledge of sin. It shows people what their sin is. That's what Paul said in Romans 7. He said, I not know sin, but by the law. Okay, by the law is the knowledge of sin. And it says that every mouth may be stopped, takes away excuses so that people stop defending their sin. 
It says that all the world may become guilty before God. They need to see what their sin is and they need to see that they are guilty before God as well. That they are guilty of breaking God's commandments. The Bible says for sin is the transgression or the breaking of God's law. Transgression of the law. And they need to see that they're guilty of doing that. They're guilty before God. They deserve to be punished for their sin. That's what the law is showing them. And then it also shows, therefore by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, that the law also cannot save someone. No flesh is justified by the deeds of the law, by trying to keep the law. Because the only way to be saved by the law is to keep it perfectly. No man ever has. The only one that has is Jesus Christ. Okay? But no one can keep it. And so the law can't save you unless you keep it perfectly. So what it does is gives you the knowledge of sin, shows you your sin, stops your mouth from excuses, shows you you're guilty and your desperate need for the Savior, which it says in Galatians 3.24, wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. The law shows you. It is a schoolmaster that teaches you. What does it teach you? You are a sinner, guilty before God. The law cannot save you. Doing good works cannot save you. You, you, are, uh, you deserve to be punished. And the only thing that can save you is faith in Jesus Christ. That's it. That's the purpose of the law. Is to show you there is no salvation and no hope in anything or anyone else except Jesus Christ. That's what the law does. And so when we bring it back to what I was talking about earlier about the Streisand effect and the forbidden fruit, that's what the Streisand effect is. And it's, that's how I was showing how it's tied together with the, with the reaction to the law of God. Because when man is, you know, sinful, his flesh is wicked, when he hears the law saying, this is bad, thou shall not do that, he rebels against it. That's the reaction. I want to do that which is forbidden. And so we see that this is rooted in that principle and that the only way to be freed from that is putting repenting and putting your faith in Jesus Christ. That is it. Because then you are the Bible says that you, sin no longer has dominion over you. doesn't rule over your life like a king. You are born again. Jesus said you must be born again. When you're born again, you become, you go from being spiritually dead, which is your whole life is ruled by this sinful nature, and you are stuck in this manipulation of the Streisand effect and all these things. You go from being spiritually dead to being spiritually alive, which is called quickened. And then when that happens, now you have the ability to walk after the spirit and not after the flesh. And when you walk after the spirit, when you walk after a Holy Spirit led life, then you can actually escape the trap of the Streisand effect, the forbidden fruit effect, because now you are given the power to overcome that to flee away from that temptation. That's what happens when you're born again. You are given all things that pertain to life and godliness. Okay? And you no longer live your life running around going, I'm going to do everything that I'm not supposed to do because I'm in rebellion against God. I'm a rebellion against my parents and all these different things. And so my flesh just wants to do everything I'm not supposed to do. Yeah, that's called rebellion. And you will forever be stuck in that endless cycle, which is slavery, by the way, to your sin, until you repent of a life of rebellion against God and put your faith in Jesus Christ. And you will not be free until that moment. You only can have that freedom through Jesus Christ. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And if the Son, therefore, shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. That's the only way. Okay? And so, that about wraps it up. So let me just conclude by saying this. 
we see uh, the root of this problem. I, t- I, t- I told you you're going to, uh, you know, um, bring this around to spiritual things. And so you see the root of that, spiritually speaking. And you see the solution to that. And I also want you to remember everything we talked about so that you, even as a Christian, need to sharpen your discernment and be very careful. When you see just because someone is attacked and banned and censored and all these different things, that does not automatically mean that they're good, that they can be trusted, that they're telling the truth and all these things. They're they're saying what they don't want you to hear and all these things. Now, that doesn't automatically mean that everyone that's censored and banned is is, um, bad. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying it doesn't mean they should automatically be trusted. You should be testing. Okay? It's not proof that they can be trusted. But some people act like that is proof. Oh, they, the deep state hates the person. That means they must be good. No. They can use that against you very easily. In fact, they are. And I could, there's so much stuff that I didn't even put in this teaching because I think a lot of you couldn't handle it. I, th- I don't think you could. And also, I put out some other stuff years ago and I got in big trouble for it. Big trouble. I got a lot of heat and a lot of weird things started happening. People started contacting me. Huge YouTube channels contacting me. Weird stuff. But I'm giving you the principles right now so you can see through a lot of this stuff. It's up to you to listen or not. That's your choice. But I hope you listen. Because we're in for a rocky ride with the deception. And I hope this helps your discernment to be sharpened. I hope this is a blessing to you. Thanks for watching and listening. Please like, share, and subscribe. Especially go to the description to subscribe to the Telegram feed where you're going to get all the PDFs of the notes, uncensored news, and you can find me there with all the updates and if I get censored off different platforms. Funny enough, I always say that at the end, if I get censored. Again, I could be censored. Other people can be censored. I know personally uh, other people who have been censored who I know for a fact aren't controlled opposition. It just happens sometimes. You have to look at the big picture. And also, let me tell you something else. You know what else is, uh, what actually works even more is shadow banning. Shadow banning is more effective than outright banning and censorship. Just wanted to add that in quickly at the end. But thank you for all the support, all the prayers and the gifts and everything else. God bless you. Have a good day.